kept a low profile through the years, preferring to stay quietly but firmly supportive in the background. With unfailing support of my wife and partner, I have lived my life to the fullest. Singaporeans know only Kwa Gyok Chu's public identity as the wife of Singapore's first and longest serving Prime Minister and mother to its third. But Kwa Gyok Chu was also a woman in her own right, one who was ahead of her time, who married without her parents' knowledge and blessings while still an undergraduate in a foreign land. Kwa Gyok Chu was one of eight children. Her father, Kwa Siu Ti, was a banker. An outstanding student at Methodist Girls School, she topped the 1936 senior Cambridge examinations for the whole of Malaya and Singapore. At Raffles Institution, she caught the attention of a young Lee Kuan Yew when she gave him unexpectedly stiff competition for a Queen's Scholarship. But academic rivalry aside, he knew he had found his equal and his soulmate. Their relationship grew through the years of Japanese occupation when they met regularly at the home of Lee's schoolmate, Yong Yuk Lin, who was also Kwa Gyok Chu's brother-in-law. The two men then had a gum-making cottage industry going on at Yong's home. By September 1944, love had blossomed. When World War II ended, Lee Kuan Yew left to study law in England in 1946. But he was miserable until Kwa Gyok Chu joined him at Cambridge University a year later on a Queen's Scholarship. She had missed a year but was to go on to complete her course in two years and got her first-class honours in the end. The two married secretly on 23rd December 1947. She had just turned 27 and he was 24. You can't explain these things. <laughs> he had tremendous aplomb. Self-confidence. Uh, very jaunty. He was a handsome young man. <laughs> When Mr. Lee got more involved in politics and became Singapore's Prime Minister in 1959, it was Mrs. Lee and his younger brother Lee Kim Yu who built up and expanded Lee & Lee, the law firm all three had set up in 1955. In her own way, Mrs. Lee was Mr. Lee's personal compass. She focused on the home front, allowing him to focus on politics as he worked to secure the future of a newly independent Singapore. Mr. Lee once said his great advantage was that he had a wife who could be a sole breadwinner and also bring up the children. That was his, quote, insurance policy, which allowed him to play the role he did in Singapore's history. And Mrs. Lee took great care to ensure she was always an asset and never a liability to her husband. For example, when writing letters to government agencies on behalf of her clients, she would leave her name out. She doesn't want the government servants to see that this is a letter from her. She doesn't want to even give the civil servants a chance to be favor play favoritism. So if she takes favors, get business from people and do them favors, it will affect me. So she was very careful. Because even without doing bad things, people say bad things about you. <laughs> so we have to be careful. She was also supportive in other ways. Away from the media glare, whenever Mr. Lee was at the political forefront in his Tanjung Paga constituency, hers was an assuring presence in the background. The late Mr. Lim Kim San once said a tribute to Mr. Lee Kuan Yew would be incomplete without referring to Mrs. Lee. Few would disagree with him. A loving and devoted wife and mother, she has stood by him through thick and thin. There's no doubt she must have been of great help and comfort to him in 
his stressful but successful political career. If I may say so, Mrs. Lee has been working in tandem with senior minister for the good of Singapore. Indeed, her inputs behind the scene were little known. During the separation talks with Malaysian Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman, Mr Lee knew that water would one day become a pressure point on Singapore. So he wanted the water agreement to be part of the separation agreement to provide Singapore with water up till 2011 and 2061. That water agreement was put into the separation agreement because I got her to do it. Mr Barker was not a conveyancer. So he did the separation agreement. He went down to the library, dug up the precedents, found one in the West Indies where they separated in a federation. But when I asked him to put in the water agreement, he said, no, better get... He was a partner with the two of us, with my brother. So he knew that my wife could do it better than him. So my wife did that part of the water agreement was sent back to take charge of his end. Mr. Lee also admitted candidly that his wife had helped clean up his speeches. She read his drafts, gave her views, improved on his presentation and helped put the points across clearly. And she was his, quote, powerful critic and helper when he wrote his memoirs, often staying up late into the night with him to work on it. Mrs. Lee had a deep interest in gardens and greenery. And this showed on her visits to parks and when Singapore was developing as a garden city. Nature was seen as having an important role in lifting the spirits. You either have the Western view, you marry the woman you love, or the Eastern view, you love the woman you marry. <laughs> Well, I tried to match both. <laughs> and I think it wasn't a bad choice. In October 2003, Mrs. Lee suffered a stroke while on a visit to London. Her doctors took the calculated risk of flying her back on a Singapore Airlines flight. Fortunately, she made a good recovery. She kept up an active lifestyle with exercises and walks playing a key part and was again seen in public at her husband's side at community events and on travels overseas. She knows that you are an inexperienced boss. I ride in front. <laughs> Just that cannot be done. You, you can hold the... Oh, all right. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay. Just pretend all right. I'm ready. Very good. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Lee never lost the bond they found since they first fell in love. This was evident when they shared a nostalgic moment in April 2005 during a visit to Ruma Tumasek, an historic building in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. They had stayed here on and off in the 1960s when they visited the Malaysian capital. That's me with somebody, I can't remember. Probably one of the jogging girls. Jogging girls. <laughs> Later, halfway through an interview, Mrs. Lee interrupted the recording, a simple act which said more than a thousand words. What is that? That's paper. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter. It needs a... Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> My 
A great support to her husband in his public duties, especially during Singapore's early tumultuous years, she was just as important in her children's lives. Mr. Lee once said, in the family, she made most of the decisions. But Mrs. Lee shied away from a high profile. Even when she was a guest of honour at a fundraising dinner hosted by the International Women's Forum Singapore Chapter in 2007, she made it clear the limelight was not for her. It would be an interesting evening. It was understood that he was not making a speech. And I never was expected to make a speech. So I'll just say good night to everybody. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed myself and I hope you have too. Good night and thank you. An immensely private woman, that was how she wanted it to be. Few would doubt Kwa Gyok Chu's contributions to Singapore had been most significant and pivotal to its history. If she weren't an influence in my, supposing I'd married somebody else, I might have become a different person. I mean, not that I would be a different person, but the things I would have been able to do, uh, the kind of backdrop I would have had, family support would have been different. Her husband delivered the first eulogy, recounting the 63 years together. Her love of botany and words and the walks they took in the evenings. Madam Kwa never stopped caring for others, even after she fell ill. When I kissed her on her cheek, she told me not to come too close to her in case I caught her pneumonia. I assured her that the doctors did not think I was likely because I was active. When given peaches in hospital, she asked the maid to take one home for me, for my lunch. I was the center of her life. And she wanted to remain together with her husband up to the very end. Her last wish she shared with me was to enjoin our children to have our ashes placed together as we were in life. Madam Kwa was always there for the family. I have precious memories of our 63 years together. Without her, I would have been a different man and a completely different life. She devoted herself to me and our children. She was always there when I needed her. She has lived a life full of warmth and meaning. I should find solace at the 89 years of her life well lived. But at this moment of the final parting, my heart is heavy with sorrow and grief. As the funeral came to a close, one by one, family members placed carnations in the coffin. And at the end of the line was Mr. Lee, bearing his final gift, a single rose, a last goodbye. <laughs>